We are The Point, a church that loves God, loves people, and loves life. If you are interested in learning more about us, please go to our website, thepointva.com. Thanks for listening. Before I welcome out the panel, I have a few thoughts that I want to share with you. Last week, Pastor Gabe, as Dave said, kicked off our series out of commission, and he took us to the book of Matthew where Jesus spoke the last words right before he ascended into heaven, so we know these words are important. In Matthew 28, Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. And Pastor Gabe challenged us that this doesn't just mean go someday or for the people that go, but it means as we are going every day, we're on mission with God to make disciples. This morning, I want to share with you another version of this same instance right before Jesus ascended into heaven from the book of Acts. This is in Acts 1, verse 8. Here's what Jesus says. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Now, I want you to think for a minute. What if you were among these 12 disciples who were standing there watching Jesus say these words and then ascend into heaven? How would you feel? I think I would feel overwhelmed. If I just got given the task that I'm supposed to go and make a disciple of every nation, even the remotest part of the earth. And remember, this is before airplanes, right? Okay, so these 12 men are given this task. But there's two key things I want to point out to you. They couldn't do it alone. Number one, they needed the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit. And number two, it was a partnership. This was not just for those 12 men. It was the call of the church of Jesus Christ. It's way bigger than any one person. It's way bigger than any one church. But collectively together, we are called to go to our Jerusalem, Judea, and even to the uttermost parts of the earth. When we're talking about being out of commission. I was thinking about that, and if I'm honest with you, I'll tell you what makes me feel out of commission most of the time. It's the feeling of being insignificant. Sometimes I look at the needs of the people in my life, the needs of the world, the hurt and the pain, and I think, how can I make a difference? Sometimes I sit in a public place like an airport and I watch hundreds of people walk by, person after person. I don't know any of them and they don't know me. And I think, how can I make a difference? Sometimes I tell myself, well, maybe if I had a bigger platform, a better position, more financial resources, then I could make more of an impact. But God has been challenging me with this phrase. Don't let what you can't do stop you from doing what you can do. See, sometimes we have this desire to be known, to be famous, to be bigger, when God just wants us to be a person of impact and influence right where we are. And as I was preparing for this morning, God put a passage of scripture on my mind, which is Romans chapter 16. And here, it's a long list of names, okay? So it's one of those that's easy to skip over. It's kind of like when you go to the movies and they play the credits at the end. Most of us don't read all the credits, right? I was thinking about a few years ago, our family had a friend who made a local movie, and they borrowed my dad's truck. He had this old F-250, so they borrowed the truck, and it was in the movie. So my whole family watched this movie that we would have never watched if we didn't know that my dad's truck was in it, but we watched it because we wanted to see the scenes with the truck. And not only did we watch the movie, we watched all the credits at the end because within those credits, my dad was mentioned by name as well as his nice F-250, right? So those credits had personal significance to us. They mattered to us, so we watched them. That's what these words in Romans 16 are. They are people who stood with the Apostle Paul as he was reaching nations for Jesus. They were people of significance. I'm just going to read a few of them to you. One is Phoebe, a servant of the church. Another is Priscilla and Aquila, fellow workers who risked their lives for Paul's needs. And he asked to give greetings to the church that meets with them. He talks about... Urbanus, a fellow worker, Mary, who has worked hard for you. And he lists all these names of people. Now, as a church, we're going to talk about our international outreach. And think about this. We could have said as a church, how can we reach the whole world? What impact can we make? We can't be in every nation in every place. But in our early days, 
God gave us the opportunity to go to a nation of Guatemala and partner with a ministry called Hope of Life, and we began sending teams. Since then, God has opened the door and given us a vision to be in 50 nations by our 50th year as a church. Currently, we are partnering in nine different countries with nine different ministries, and I honestly believe if you asked each of those ministries to give their Romans 16, the people who have influenced them, that have made a difference in their nation and in their churches, they would list the Point Church. I would think of, I can hear it in my mind, our church from Cuba talking about our partnership, La Iglesia del Punto right? They say the Point Church, and I hear them saying over and over and over because our partnership is so valuable in every one of those nations. And not only do I believe that the Point Church would be listed by name, I believe there's people in this room who would be on that list. I can't name them all, but this morning we have a few representatives with our panel that are going to come and share with you. So will you join me in welcoming our panel this morning? So we're going to get to hear from several different people, but I want to start by taking you back to 2017. In 2017, I had the opportunity to travel with a friend of mine who invited me to go to Liberia. Leading up to that, I began to study the people of Liberia, and I learned about a brutal civil war that had torn that nation apart. It devastated and destroyed most of the property, the land, the resources. Many children were forced to be child soldiers. Many women were raped. People were pillaged. And God gave me the opportunity to go there on a very special week. It was a week that a new school called Petals of Hope was opening up. And I got to be there the first time some young ladies in the country of Liberia ever stepped foot in the door of a school. And I watched their faces light up with joy, delight, and hope. I think we have a picture of the school girls to show this morning. You see those sweet, precious girls. This is on the second time I went. And that has burned in my heart. So I came back and I shared with Pastor Gabe about my experience. And he said, I think this is supposed to be one of our REACH partnerships. And so last year, we were able to take a team in November to help with this school and do several things. And I'm super excited this morning that the leader of this ministry, as well as one of my coworkers, who's the um, regional director for Africa at Advancing Native Missions, Tony Weeder, is here with us this morning. Tony and his wife, Beth, are from Liberia. And during the Civil War, they were forced to leave the country as refugees. Now, it's a very long story, and we cannot go into it this morning. But if you are interested, his wife has captured a lot of it in a book called Out of the Ashes. So I encourage you, if you want to read more, to go to that. But they left the country. They established themselves as citizens in the U.S. eventually. They raised their family. And now they're doing ministry in the nation of Liberia. And Tony, I want to ask you this question. Why, after you came back to the U.S., or when you came to the U.S. and had a comfortable, established life, did you and Beth go back into your nation and begin ministry? Well, first of all, thank you so much, Church, Pastor Gabe, and to all the leadership here for coming to Liberia. Uh, Briefly, Liberia was founded in 1822 by African-American free slaves from here. Our first president came from Fredericksburg. So just so you know, (laughs) but briefly, uh, the reason why we did that was when we came here, the kindness of the Christians here could not allow us to forget where we came from and the destruction. And we wanted to go back with that kindness and the gifting that they have given us to share. It's almost like giving back what God gave us in this country. Okay. Now, our team came to visit in November. I'd like you to share with the church a little bit about what happened on that trip and the impact that it made in the nation of Liberia. Oh, you guys love time, so I don't have time. I only have a watch. (laughs) Um, I'll be brief. Amber, I'm telling you, um, I think it's in his book, D. Lord Jones, Preaching and the Preacher. He said, it is one thing to love preaching, but do you love the people you're preaching to? And you showed that that you did not just love missions, but you actually love my people. Water, when you came, we had no water. You left water behind. When you came, there was no running water. For the first time, you saw that. Since 1989, there's no running water in Liberia. 
Since 1989, there's no electricity in my country. And when the Point Church came, you left behind some of these things. Uh, last year, the complaint we had from our school because of Miss Kelly, her teaching, her training of our teachers, and the women workshop that you did, it has changed lives. You have transformed lives. That's what you did. You, you, we are what you call the even the automobile parts of the world. You came and reached us. You gave us hope. You sat with people, not money, but you listened to their stories. And you told your story. And with that, like we say in West Africa, it takes two hands to wash one. And you have come to work with us. In 10 days, you transform our ministry uh, by going on TV, by going on the radio, by going within the community, by doing health, uh, bread, bread, right? Mm -hmm. And Misty. I think Brett reminded me of Jeremiah because everywhere I saw him, he was crying. Uh, <laughs> and just the love you show, little is much when God is in it. When, thank you, God. When we were there, you um, mentioned to me that it was very significant to have a group of Americans doing what we were doing, and it received such a good reputation. Why was that? Well, first of all, I imagine you sitting on the floor, you know, sorting through books. Uh, I think we might be maybe two or three percent of all the schools in Liberia that have a mini library, thanks to the Point Church, and you were part of that. And people saw you doing that. An educated young woman leaving home, coming all the way there, along with other Americans who's supposed to be, I mean, living the American dream, uh, like going to Walmart. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but you came and left all of that, working with the women. Uh, Philip, Philip now, is so popular in Liberia because- Philip's the plumber that yeah, we work Philip with. is the plumber. <laughs> and Philip was a Muslim before your coming. Julius worked with him. Julius gave him his Bible. Julius trained him. Now he's not going to the mosque when they challenge him. He said, well, I'm not going to the mosque anymore because my boss gave me a Bible and he told me to go to church. Mm -hmm. And so because you came, it gave us a little bit of status leverage and understanding even what is on the radio what it was on tv people heard your story in fact one of the journalists asked you why are you here mm -hmm. and you gave that story so in a nutshell that's why people were just so touched briefly especially you remember the lady who came to the clinic that day mm -hmm. no one would touch her her parents would not touch her it was brett brian that brought a wheelchair that your dad shipped to Liberia, put that woman in the chair. Because you touch her, she was now touchable. Thank you, Tony. So, because they say a picture's worth a thousand words, I'm just gonna highlight with pictures a few of the things that you talked about. He didn't, they didn't put the pictures up yet, did they? Okay, so first, this is the tower, water tower that we helped to put in with the people, which allowed their village to have running water in their house and the school for the first time ever, which is amazing. And the next picture, this is a memory that burned in um, my mind. These are the girls from the school right before they turned on water for the first time. So this is most of them the first time they would have ever seen running water. And we were able, as a church, because of your generosity, to put running water in their school where they go every day. Um, then the next picture is the girls getting water from a water purification system that the point actually was able to purchase as well. So not only do they have running water, they have pure clean water. And then the last one, this is just, um, Tony wanted to make sure that we didn't leave this out. This is Kelly who helped lead the team playing with the girls and she did some training for the teachers. So lots of amazing things happened. And Kelly has great moves. <laughs> Okay, so now I want to introduce you to a, two, a few people from The Point. We're going to start with Cody. Cody um, is actually the only person on this stage that I haven't traveled with personally, but Cody, you've been to a lot of places. Can you tell us where you've traveled? 
Yes, I've been to Guatemala five times, um, and then recently Cuba and the Philippines, and then I've got Cuba and Guatemala coming up at the end of the year. Awesome. So tell us about how going on reach trips has impacted you personally. Uh, yes, so I could be up here all day. Um, our Lord has used international missions as my ground zero. Um, each trip, he has wrecked me, um, stopped me dead in my tracks, wrecked me, and then healed me. When I look back on the, um, the major seasons of spiritual growth in my life, I can correlate a large portion of them to these trips. That first trip to Guatemala in 2014 um, stirred inside of me something profound. I've always had a heart for missions and a passion for missions, but I was just set on fire. And each trip since then, he has left um, an incredible mark on me and shown me more and more of his goodness and love for me. And when I go all in, there's no way I don't come back with faith stronger than I left. And um, Pastor Gabe talked on this last week. Um, these trips have taught me that missions is a 24-7, 365 responsibility and command. And I'll say it again louder for the people in the back. <laughs> <laughs> missions is a 24-7, 365 responsibility and command. Wherever we are, we should be leading people to Christ and not only leading people, but making disciples of those that already believe and strengthening that relationship. Um, to those. I like to break down that verse you shared from Acts 1-8. Um, think of Jerusalem as your community, Judea as your country, um, uh, or Judea as your state, Samaria as your country, and then the rest of the world. Um, we should be making disciples wherever we are. Thank you, Cody. Thank you for going. Next, we're going to hear from Felix. And Felix is one of those people that I never really got to know till I traveled to Cuba with him. But he's an amazing man of God with one of huge pastoral heart for people. So Felix went last year to Cuba and then this year went to Mexico. Felix, tell us a little bit about the impact this has had on your life. Good morning, uh, Point family. Um, I want to share a little bit about, put it in two words, it's life changing when you go to mission work, when you go to these countries and, and see people the way they, they live and how happy they are. I'm not saying that my heart was heartened, but maybe some parts of my heart were hard and God started working in those areas. Um, that's how mission work has impacted my life, uh, going to Cuba and Mexico as well. So if you're thinking about mission or you haven't thought about mission, um, it's life-changing. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from Josh and Jesse Wilson, which I'm excited to hear from them because I remember when they came to the point, and I've seen God completely transform their lives, and it's been amazing to watch. And I just want to mention, if you don't know Jesse, Jesse is the admin director at the point, so everything that happens wouldn't happen without her. And she's also is part of that responsibility, leading all of our reach teams and trips and coordinating that. So I want to ask you, because I know you've been leading together as a couple, how has being involved in REACH impacted your family? We'll start with you, Josh. All right. Um, so the, um, it's impacted my family. Um, we're supposed to raise up our children uh, and, and teach them what it is that, that God wants for them. Um, and not only teach them, but to show them. Uh, and so one of the things uh, that's really been amazing for us is the fact that uh, Amelia gets to see us go and go out and do the Lord's work. Uh, but it's also put a passion in her heart uh, to do the same thing. We sat down at a, uh, at a banquet not too long ago, and, um, and they were talking about funding missions and taking care of missionaries and things like that. And uh, for, for a while, Amelia has been getting an allowance. And uh, the second that they talked about helping fund uh, the work that the Lord is doing through these people, Amelia turned to me and said, Daddy, can I give them my allowance? Can I give them uh, what I have? Mm -hmm. Which... In the time it took everything I had to hold back uh, the same tears that I'm holding back now. Uh, because it's, it's one of those moments that God gives you that says that maybe, maybe you are 
doing what you're supposed to be doing. Thank you. Jesse, now that he's made you cry a little. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been the theme of the morning. Um, I think that, so Josh went on a mission trip first. He went with his brother to Cuba last August. And when he came home, the first thing he said to me when he got off the plane was, you got to go with me. You've got to experience this. We've got to go together. So we talked about going to Cuba last year. And Amber said, well, why don't you lead? So we led my first mission trip ever, which was fun. Um, and we agreed that I'd do all the paperwork, admin stuff, stateside, and then he would lead once we got in country because I had never done it before. And um, the impact that it made on me to be on the mission field was one thing, but the impact that it made on me to see my husband grow in the Lord on the mission field and act out the giftings that God has given him changed my whole perspective on it. Um, I thought he was cute before, but... <laughs> Um, it really is something, it really changes your marriage to serve together here, which we've done since day one at the point, which has completely changed our marriage. Like years of serving together on Sunday mornings has built a relationship and a communication between us that is amazing. But to do it on the mission field and to be walking in the spirit for a week completely straight, it, it really changes you as a couple. And it really... It really changed my heart to see him serve out his giftings in the way that he did on the mission field. Thank you. Now, we could sit up here for hours, but we don't have hours, and share stories of how God works. But something we encourage every person that goes on a trip to do is look for God moments. Look for those moments where God is working and you see things that only he could do. So I've asked um, each of these panel participants, so to speak, to think about a God moment that really they saw God move in a miraculous way on their trip. So they're all going to share briefly their stories. Okay, Cody, so we'll start with you, and then we'll just work down the line, okay? Um, you should have seen the look Amber just gave me, briefly. <laughs> <laughs> I felt her eyes piercing through my soul just now. I'm going to try to keep it brief. Um, this is a big one for me. Um, it's probably my favorite, but also um, scariest and least expected God moment. Um, you'll see in a minute on the screen there are some couches that look pretty ordinary, um, this was last summer in Guatemala. Um, it was a very unique trip. We were celebrating five years of work in one village and starting work in a new village. Um, and it had a whole group of returners, people that I had served with and um, quite frankly had become a little family with over the years um, working alongside of them. And it was on a Monday night on these couches during Devo's um, where I found myself quite a hot mess. Um, I had been questioning and wrestling with some doubt and fear. Um, me on this trip, whether I was supposed to be here or not, my role in international missions. Um, and at the time, I thought it was really weird, my testimony. Um, I had shared my testimony many times before on the mission field. Um, but the Lord was putting on my heart that I had always been holding back. Um, I was always a little hesitant. There was about the first 15 years that never got discussed, um, I never told anyone about, um, had never uttered and quite frankly was um, denying to myself. And it was all about to change in the blink of an eye um, on these sofas. <laughs> um, I bared my soul and laid it all out and just immediately felt the burden um, lift away, um, the chains that were broken. And what, what was amazing is not only the freedom that, and breakthrough that I had, but it rippled throughout the rest of the week. And Melody Criswell sitting down here, and I'm trying not to look at her because she's going to get me all emotional. Uh, <laughs> we just, um, our entire group had an incredible um, week of um, trading that shame and fear for freedom and redemption. And our God is a God of abundance. When we came back, I just felt the Holy Spirit tell me that I was supposed to tell that at group. And we've seen the same change. Um, I'm in a group with Josh and Jesse. We've seen that in our group just week after week, people just encouraged by the last person opening up. And I would just encourage any of you, um, the things that we're keeping tucked away in the shadows that we don't wanna tell ourselves or that we don't want everybody else to know about, please tell them, because there's nothing that you've done or had done to you um, that he can't use and 
it nowhere close to outweighs the love and grace and freedom that he has to offer you. So I will try to make mine brief. God moments normally aren't described briefly, but I'll try. Um, so we went to Mexico last year on an exploratory mission trip, and we met the family of the ministry down there, Seed Time and Harvest. And um, Pastor Stephen is an amazing pastor who's been down there for 30 years, and he has a daughter named Elisa. And she has been married to her husband for seven years now, six when we were there. Um, and for five years, they had been struggling with infertility. They had miscarriages. Um, and while we were there, she shared with us all of the things that, um, all of the heartache that, that, they had, that they had gone through. They were currently remodeling their home to change one room into a nursery because God told them in obedience to build the nursery and he would provide the baby. Um, each woman that was on the trip, there were several of us, um, went at some point in time and felt a God, God calling them to lay hands on her and pray for her. Um, and two weeks after we got home, she sent us a positive pregnancy test. So we prayed through the nine months that she would keep the baby. Um, there were times where the doctors were saying that it wasn't going to be possible. And we have a picture of cute little baby Jane. It was, it was amazing to go down there and to pray for her and over her and her baby and pray stateside the entire time that she was pregnant. And we went back while she was nine months pregnant. She had the baby two days after I flew out, which me and God are still talking about because <laughs> I wanted to hold that baby. Um, but it's just amazing to see how our prayers from over here changed lives over there. And she was able to have this baby and just have a miracle. So my God moment is, um also in Mexico, um, for those of you who know our past, uh, Mexico has a lot to do with uh, addicts and recovery and, um, and cartels and things like that. Um, one of the other cool things that they have is uh, a very thriving soccer ministry, which is something that we're involved in here, uh, is um, coaching Amelia's soccer team. Um, I think we've got a picture of their kids um, and so Mexico really uh, speaks to us. And uh, one of the things that really got me the first trip that we went on, we were talking to the pastor and uh, we were kind of talking through the situations that he's found himself in, uh, the people that he has to deal with every day. Uh, and he was, he was saying that, that if you want to win people to Christ, Sometimes you've got to go where Christ isn't. And so that really touched me, and uh, it really kind of sparked something in me to make sure that as God allows us to go through what it is that we go through, that we spend the time when we're on the other side safely to reach back and bring people with us. My, uh, my God moment was, um, it actually has been in Cuba and Mexico. Uh, first time while in Cuba was, uh, we were riding in the, in the van, and all of a sudden the um, tears com started coming out, and I, I couldn't figure out why. But I know that uh, when, when tears start coming out, God is, do is watching you. From, from your head to, to until about the, your feet. He's watching you internally and changing your heart. Uh, and this has happened every mission, uh, these two mission trips that I have been. Thank you. Now, I think every person that's sitting on this stage would say, you know, we're just ordinary people, but we serve a big powerful God. And I believe every one of you sitting in this room, God is calling to be in that Romans 16 we talked about earlier for someone 
for some country, for some people, because we all have a calling. The Great Commission wasn't just for the 12 disciples. It was for me, and it was for you. And so I want to take a few minutes to pray over you this morning as a church. Father, I just thank you so much for the power of who you are, for the testimonies of these people sitting on this stage, for every person sitting here listening this morning, that we serve a big powerful God who's alive and active and moving among the nations. And God, I pray that you will help us see what it is that you're calling us to do. Let us not think of ourselves as insignificant, but instead look for how we can make an impact, how we can change lives, how we can share your good news the same way that it's changed us. In your son's name, amen. So I want to mention a few things to you. If you're listening this morning and you're thinking, maybe that's supposed to be me going on one of those REACH trips. We have an amazing team at the REACH table who's going to be ready to talk to you, tell you about what trips are coming up, help you take that step. Maybe you came in this morning and God stirred something in you and you want somebody to pray with you. Or maybe you just had something on your heart before you even walked in the door. We have a prayer team who's going to be down front and they would love to pray with you. And I want to speak for a minute to those of you who are sitting in this room and have no idea what it means to be on mission with God. If you're his child, today's the day to step forward and begin to walk in that. And if you don't know Jesus, your first step to being on mission with God is accepting him as your savior. And we want to give you the opportunity to do that this morning. I'm going to pray a prayer with you. This prayer doesn't offer salvation. Jesus offers salvation. But this is a way for you to turn your heart and your life to Jesus. So if you will join with me in praying this, and if you already know Jesus, I encourage you to pray out loud these words with us. Heavenly Father, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for sending him to die on the cross for my sin. Come into my heart. Cleanse me of my sin. Give me the courage to live for you from this day forward. Amen.